Hello, everyone. All righty. So I'm just going to uh, give a couple minutes for people to trickle in. Uh, I'm just going to get my Q&A box set up for myself, uh, as well as um, just the chat box. So we have everything already. Uh, I think this is the chat here. Perfect. Let's go panelists. Excellent. Okay. See people trickling in. That's perfect. All righty. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me this evening and thank you so much for uh, Healthy Planet for hosting me. Uh, my name is Dr. Brianna Lutz. I am a uh, naturopathic doctor as well as a registered herbalist, uh, as well as a medical advisor and brand uh, education manager with St. Francis Herb Farm, which gives me the opportunity to give this presentation this evening. So I just want to pop in the chat here um, and make sure that you can see and hear me. So can you see and hear me? So uh, if you find the chat box there, excellent. Thank you for that confirmation. Perfect. So just a couple uh, housekeeping items. Uh, we have the chat box as well as we have the Q&A section. Uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation, okay? What I'll get you to do, however, is pop it into the Q&A box. So Put questions in the Q&A box. If there's any um, logistical issues, you can't hear me, um, something cuts out, pop that in the chat. So I'm, I'm alerted with that. Um, but if something's brought up in the chat or you ask a question in the chat, I might miss it if it's not in the Q&A box. That way I can get through my slide, get through my thought and then get to your question. Or if I know I'm coming to your question uh, in an upcoming slide or um, in an upcoming thought, then I'll, I'll certainly get to your, to your question as well. So like I mentioned, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation pop it in the Q&A box. Uh, and then ideally we're gonna have some time at the end for, for questions as well. So uh, we have some great material to get through very timely. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm practicing and, and living in Edmonton. So we've had a very bizarre, very late spring. It's kind of like we went straight from winter into summer. And so I've heard out East that there's actually um, a nice heat wave coming through there um, but very timely for this for this presentation and a conversation around uh, supported detoxification and um, most people are drawn to that in in the springtime uh, even from Chinese medicine when we think about the spring we think about renewal um, and oftentimes it's about kind of clearing away some of this the sluggishness of winter especially our our wonderfully cold uh, Canadian winters where we might be hunkered inside a lot more so so as all the buds are coming out, everything is turning green, uh, we kind of turn inward and, and think what we can be doing for ourselves to give ourselves a little bit of a, of a spring reset. Okay, so I'm just going to make sure I'm recording here. Perfect. Okay, so for the presentation today, just a bit of an overview, we're going to discuss our organs of elimination and our natural mechanisms of detoxification. And this is where we're going to spend a, a large amount of time because when we look at different interventions or things that we can do to actually support these systems, it's really, to, really important to understand these different organs of, organs of elimination and how that is actually functioning uh, from, from a natural standpoint. Uh, and I'll go into what the difference is between a cleanse and a supportive detoxification. Uh, and then I'll mention a few products today um, from St. Francis Herb Farm, but largely I really want you to understand these different organs of elimination um, and how you can facilitate their, their function. All right, so when we talk about detoxification, it's normal to first ask like, what's a toxin? What's a waste product? And, and, and I want to really emphasize here that you are not toxic, right? I think that we have this really fearful mentality around toxicity um, and what that actually means from an internal perspective, what that means from an envir environmental perspective. Um, and to show you that your body is actually 
actually uh, eliminating these wastes and these toxins all the time, but there's also means to support that a little bit more efficiently. So from a fundamental standpoint, our body is going to create toxins or waste products. That's just a matter of uh, all of our cellular processes that need to happen, our digestion and how we utilize nutrients, all the time we're going to be creating different waste products. Uh, so for example, um, through cellular energy and through cellular work, we might be creating lactic acid. Uh, there's also something called oxidative stress. Um, so you can kind of think about this being uh, like rust on metal, right? So it's exposed to the elements. There's this oxidative stress. And that's why nutritionally, it's really important to have antioxidants, right? So our food and our nutrition. And I see Johnny is just joining me. Uh, so he's going to be our, our panelist or uh, my, my partner in crime here today as well and can help field stuff in the chat. Um, so the, the oxidative stress component, antioxidants are really important, right? So already by eating antioxidant foods, we're helping to support and reduce the, the consequences or the side effects of all of these just natural processes happening within our system. There's also something called volatile organic compounds or VOCs. And these are quite classically um, things that are that you would smell. OK, so fragrance. Fragrance is a huge one. Now, what's interesting about frag fragrance is that is it, it is a proprietary thing. And on labeling, we don't actually have to disclose what is in a fragrance. Um, so it could be any number of chemical compounds. Um, and oftentimes, or like new car smell, or fragrance in uh, laundry detergent, in perfumes, and aftershaves, and colognes, and all of our personal care products. And these are things that are um, quite typically um, hormone disrupting compounds. Um, and they're really easy to be exposed to. And quite classically, they're often fat soluble. So they like to stay in our system and they're a little bit more challenging to, to get rid of. Now we have other hormone disrupting compounds, things like pesticides or herbicides. Um, we also see this in plastics. Uh, and, and I would say that is a large exposure of, of all these different hormone disrupting chemicals as well. And then there's different heavy metals, um, such as lead or cadmium or mercury. And, and these are things even like historic, I say historically, and this was only like a few decades ago, where lead was in paint, right? Or fuel was leaded. Um, but the more we learn about how these different things can affect our health, um, we're being a little bit more conscious of uh, eliminating those from, from our environment. Now, this can get really scary quickly. <laughs> I've been to naturopathic conferences where it's environmental medicine and we're doing a whole weekend on, on different environmental toxins. And you're like, well, well what's not going to kill me, right? So what I always tell my patients and what I like to talk about is control the things that you can. Okay, so rather than, um, you know, those squishy plastic water bottles, maybe we're incorporating, um, you know, our, our emotional support water bottles that are stainless steel, um, or we're using glass. Um, and it doesn't have to be a complete overhaul of um, all of these different exposures. Um, it's about making those small incremental changes and being a very conscious consumer where you can have the biggest effect. Um, so as I mentioned, those norm metabolic byproducts are the normal toxins our body should normally be able to handle. So the reason that like detoxification and cleansing has definitely, um, surged forward is that we're having all of these new environmental exposures. So we may need you know, a bit of support with detoxification, but we have all of these mechanisms in our, in, in place and our body is constantly detoxifying. Our body is constantly eliminating and more so it's about how do we eliminate the obstacles of how it can do this and how it can run self-sufficiently. 
Um, there is a really great book uh, that I like to talk about, and I believe they're Canadian and Canadian researchers. Uh, it's called Talks In, Talks Out, and I'm just going to write that name in the chat. Uh, so Talks In, and then I think it's Dash the Talks Out. Cute little clever name there. I really like that. Um, and what I like about this, so this is by the same authors as Slow Death, Slow Death by Rubber Ducky, um, which I find like if you want to avoid kind of this the scaries of reading a book and the scaries of toxicity, skip the slow death by rubber ducky and then go to the talks and talks out because I really like that they're showing these different areas of exposure of toxicity, but they're also um, incorporating or discussing different detoxification methods and also debunking some detoxification methods. So things that um, maybe aren't actually all of that helpful or effective. Um, so they talk about saunas and actually when it comes to like VOCs, they've calculated how much with the sauna you're eliminating these different volatile organic compounds from your system. So I really like that book. Um, I do reference it in my practice when people are interested about um, learning about toxicity. Um, and we'll talk about like more sources of, of toxicity when we talk about those organs of elimination. Um, so when we talk about these different endocrine or hormone disrupting chemicals like herbicides and pesticides, I just like to make the point that St. Francis is certified organic and we do third party testing to ensure that there are no heavy metals, herbicides, pesticides, um, residues on our herbs, um, because we don't want those detoxifying herbs being contaminated with all of those things. Um, it's also really important and I get, um, you you know, my patients to prioritize like, okay, where are these sources of toxicity? Um, and what can you control? What can you change? Right? So when we look at concentrated elements, like herbal remedies, like tea, like coffee, where we're actually like diffusing and infusing those different, um, constituents and compounds and ingesting them. So they're highly concentrated. So again, we're kind of concentrating um, also those contaminants. We need to be very mindful of, of the sourcing, like especially when it comes to these different um, things. So if you're looking for um, even like your fish oils or your vitamin D or any of these things, make sure you're doing um, your, your research and, and understanding like the third party testing, third party verification, even when we're talking about fish oils that they're they're testing for mercury right or they're using small fish sources to eliminate mercury exposure so all of those things make um make a really big difference so when we talk about like uh accumulation of these different toxins you can think about like a bucket okay so our bucket is constantly filling so this is our food this is our care products uh, our workplace exposures, the air we breathe, and then these holes in the bucket are our natural means of elimination, right? So we're constantly going to be draining those different toxins from those means of detoxification. But if we're filling our bucket too quickly, or if these roots of elimination or these holes are too far and few between, or they're clogged, right? There's, there's hair in the drain. We don't want the hair in the drain. Uh, making sure that, so that, that means that this bucket can overflow, right? And so um, sometimes when, because people are like, well, well, what, how would I know that I need to support these organs of elimination? Or how do I know that, um, you know, my bucket is full. And we like to think about the skin as being like the third kidney, right? So it is this means of detoxification. So sometimes like high, like um, very sensitive skin or skin reactivity, especially when you've never really reacted before, um, that can be a threshold of toxicity. And I, and I do see that quite a lot in clinic. So um, rashes that had never happened before, acne that had never happened before, eczema, or these things kind of, kind of cropping up. Um, other signs of toxicity, like without 
other means or other um, diagnoses. Um, and, and signs of toxicity can be pretty vague. Um, some people equate it to being like hungover, right? And that's like a slight little bit of like alcohol toxicity, right? So feeling like hungover or flu-like, um, fatigue, brain fog, muscle cramps, headaches, uh, I often see is a big one. Uh, hormone issues, especially if like a thyroid issue cropped up, um, gut issues. And I know that's like a big thing right now, like even, even on, even on TikTok and that kind of thing where these like chronic gut issues are, are that, um, creating like internal toxicity or what we call endotoxins. Um, sometimes uh, a, a large part of my practice is, is fertility and conception. So sometimes difficulties with um, conception and fertility can also be a sign of you know, potential toxicity. Uh, so I see uh, a, a couple of questions and stuff coming into the chat. Um, so Johnny is just asking if he wants to share questions with me. So I, I asked attendees to just put questions in the Q&A box. So I'm just going to kind of roll with, with what came up in the Q&A box. And then I might have you facilitate um, stuff in the chat at the end when we have our designated Q&A. Um, but certainly um, I have some questions coming in through, through the Q&A box. So thanks for your help, Johnny. Um, I have a question, where can I get the book Talks In, Talks Out? Um, I believe like either Abe Books or Amazon would probably have it. Um, I think I got mine from, from Abe Books. And if you've never heard of Abe Books, they're, they're great in terms of um, getting really good used books. Um, so that's where I would probably look. Um, if you can't find the talks in, talks out, Google the, the death by rubber ducky, um, find those authors and then see if you can search um, the, the talks in, talks out book. Um, I don't know if it's like not in print anymore, but if you can find it, it's a really great resource. I try the library too. Uh, okay, so questions about saunas. So uh, infrared saunas, benefits, concerns. Um, sauna in general, I think is fantastic. Um, I like, and, and especially like either contrast with, with temperatures where people are getting like that heat exposure and then you're doing like a cold shower or you're doing like a hot tub and then a cold plunge because um, that's really going to support circulation. Uh, infrared sauna based on the wavelength it can actually penetrate a little bit deeper into tissue um, so arguably there are greater detoxification benefits um, so I'm a, I'm a fan of infrared saunas um, the benefit uh, so benefits definitely from detoxification I think it's wonderful supporting circulation I think it's fantastic especially if you're incorporating it with contrast therapy um, and then any concerns so people who shouldn't go in saunas. Um, so um, pregnancy, I know um, sometimes we have issues with um, like overheating and hot tubs and saunas and that kind of thing. So it's a pregnancy, um, some high blood pressure stuff or some heart stuff, um, again, could be contraindicated or again, if somebody shouldn't be overheating, um, but they should just talk, chat with their doctor. Um, but overall infrared saunas, beautiful, regular saunas, they're great too. Um, okay, so there are, so steam sauna is good for cleansing skin toxins. Uh, no, um, I didn't answer any of that yet. So steam sauna is again, great. Um, I think that it's whatever therapy somebody would benefit, uh, enjoys more, right? So if it's just a straight dry sauna, um, if they're using a steam sauna, if it's infrared, um, and I would say like accessibility of, of using those therapies might just be, you know, which therapy they end up going with. I don't necessarily have a preference. I, th I think infrared is really nice because there's really cool, I think they're from Costco and you could like hook up your phone and listen to a podcast and then just sweat. And so I, I think infrared saunas are great and you can actually get like self-contained units in your house um, or, or at a clinic or that kind of thing. But I would say all saunas are great. I love them. Okay. 
Okay, there are some questions that are slightly off topic, but I will come back to those. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that in the Q&A box. Okay. Oh, awesome. Somebody linked the book. <laughs> you are fantastic. Okay, so did I? No, I haven't gotten to the among trees yet. Okay, so what's the difference between a cleanse and a supportive detoxification? And I think like in the wellness sphere, um, again, it's creating that... Um, belief that you are toxic and you are not toxic. Okay. Um, it's about supporting the mechanisms of how your body naturally detoxifies. So I feel like people are generally drawn to cleanses, say in the spring or the fall time, which is a very natural and like historically um, from even like traditional Chinese medicine, like a very uh, normal and rhythm that people are really drawn to. Um, but a cleanse is more of a purgative effect. And what I mean is that we're stimulating systems to just dump out uh, either toxicity, dump out waste products, and are forcing these different organs of elimination to do the thing, right? <laughs> so I would say they're a lot harsher. They're a lot more abrasive. Um, some cleanses that people do, um, and, and also it's like very self-contained, right? Like it's, it's two weeks and you're doing this really intense cleanse, um, where you can't leave the toilet for three days, right? I, I don't like inflicting that on, on my people, nor would I want to do that for myself. Um, so cleanses are using like stimulant laxatives or, um, different things that might, uh, cause your kidneys to, um, detoxify and concentrate elements that could lead to kidney stones. Um, there are things that are like pushing your sweat or pushing your liver. So I, I don't really resonate with cleanses. I more so look at either ongoing supportive detoxification or the strategic introduction of how best can we um, support those different among trees um, or those organs of elimination. Okay. Uh, there's just a question. Can infrared sauna deplete your minerals? Uh, yes. If you're not hydrating properly. And I would say people who, um, are sweating significantly and they're not replenishing these different electrolytes, then absolutely you can, you can deplete your minerals. Um, so sweat, making sure that we're getting either those minerals or those nutrients in our food, or if some people are doing a lot more sweating that they're actually rehydrating with electrolytes and, and maintaining those minerals. Okay. Okay. And then there were just some links to, um, the book in here, but I will, I will pop them in the Q and a after in the chat after. Okay. Okay. Uh, organs of elimination. So these are also called your amunctories, uh, but I'll, I can use those interchangeably because um, organs of elimination is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but these not, our monk trees are these organ systems that are going to then create these natural forms of elimination. So feces, like your stool, urination, sweat, your breath, which is really cool, uh, increased blood flow. Um, and this can incorporate some of the, the liver filtration uh, incorporation or um, the lymphatic and, and blood system. And what I like to make people aware of, so the bowel, the liver, the kidneys and lungs, lymphatics and skin, and also the uterus, these organs of elimination are also your sources of exposure, right? Right? Like when, when we eat or our bowels are digesting and they're metabolizing and they're breaking down, our bowels are exposed to all everything that's in our food, right? Our liver is kind of like our main factory. It's our main filter system. So drugs are metabolized down um, different liver pathways. Herbs are metabolized down liver, liver pathways. Your body deals with your cholesterol. Um, your body uses kind of like your spleen and, and your, your liver for um, your like different blood products. So again, all of the, and then the skin, the skin is huge. This is an organ 
of elimination, but I would say arguably it's one of our biggest sources of exposure. And I would say that that is, um, pe people don't associate it as the, a source of exposure comparatively to their food, right? So they know sometimes about um, incorporating the clean 15 versus the dirty dozen or washing your, your produce in, in baking soda to try and um, deactivate these different pesticides and herbicides. But they might not be thinking about that when it comes to their shampoo or their laundry detergent or those kinds of things as well. Uh, okay, so bowel, obviously your digestive system and eliminating these wastes through feces. Um, and then your liver, again, metabolizing or breaking this down. We'll go a little bit more into the mechanisms of how the liver does this um, because it can get complicated very quickly. But just understanding that the liver is probably like our big powerhouse when it comes to supported detoxification. Our kidneys and lungs are actually like really, really intimately connected uh, for a couple of different reasons. Embryo embryologically, they actually developed from the same tissue in utero. Um, so they are very um, tissue similar. So this is why a lot of our lung, lung herbs actually work on the kidneys as well. Um, and when we're looking at supporting like the function of like lung and kidneys or things that we can do from a detoxification standpoint is if we're dumping, if we're using other means of um, eliminating these toxins, such as the liver, or we're supporting these different liver pathways, um, if we're not well hydrated, again, we're not further eliminating through, through the kidneys and through, through the bladder and, and, and urination, right? So if anybody before you do anything, before you look to um, herbs, before you change your diet, are you drinking enough water? Okay, because that is going to be huge when it comes to eliminating toxins out of like the kidney, kidney and bladder system in your blood. And it's also going to alleviate some constipation. Granted, not for everybody. Some people have different issues that are causing constipation, but fluid is needed for having really healthy bowel movements. So before you do anything, make sure you're drinking enough water. And again, sources of exposure or sources of elimination, sources of exposure. So ideally, if you're um, A, drinking from glass or drinking from stainless steel, um, fantastic. Um, but if you're, I would say the biggest thing is if you're heating stuff, right? If you're heating stuff that would look to mobilize these different volatile organic compounds or these different, um, like BPAs and plastic and that kind of thing. Um, so just being mindful of, of hydration. There's other stresses on the kidneys as well. And I would say one of the biggest culprits of this is actually like elevated blood sugar, right? So this is why um, like diabetics, we really look at their, um, their, their kidney health because uh, chronically elevated blood sugar can be a really big stress on the kidneys. And then we aren't getting that proper elimination um, through the kidney system. Um, although we won't be talking about the uterus specifically, um, it is an amuncturi and it is like another means of a tox detoxification in those with the uterus. Um, and know that this um, plays into pregnancy, this plays into um, preconception plans, and, and also to root of elimination, root of exposure. Um, so commercial tampons, I would say those are probably the things that are uh, most heavily spread, like, or like cotton <laughs> is bleached and, and high, high levels of, of herbicides and pesticides on there. So um, switching to different alternatives, whether that be organic cotton or changing up your um, uh, menstrual product. Okay. I don't think there was anything else I wanted to say about that. Okay, so I'm just going to have a peek at the questions here. Um, somebody popped uh, this link in um, uh, the, the Q&A instead of the chat. So I'm just going to pop that in there, uh, making sure, okay, there. And then that's done. And then I'm just going to copy this, copy, okay. And then, great. And thank you. I skipped over the lymphatic system. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. There's lots of questions. Okay. So I'm just going to keep, keep trekking. Okay. So lymphatics and skin. So I would say, um, I like to talk about these interchangeably. Um, and, and again, because they are very much connected in terms of, uh, exposure and elimination. So coming out of the skin is going to be sweat obviously. Um, and really, really great in that resource when it actually talks about the saunas and some of the tox toxins or toxicity that is being eliminated through the skin through sweat. So if you are doing any type of sauna or sweat therapy, making sure that we're having a nice shower and it'd be amazing if you do a cold shower <laughs> after um, to help uh, flush off those toxins so they're not being reabsorbed in the skin. Now, the lymphatic system, I would say, is probably one of the most under rated systems when it comes to talking about um, our health and not only from detoxification, but as a lymphatic system pertains to um, the digestive system, we have lymphatic connections in our digestive system. Uh, the lymphatic system in relationship to the immune system, right? So lymphatics is basically like secondary circulation. So our primary circulation is our blood. So how our heart will pump and move blood throughout our arteries and then how it will return in our veins. Now there are um, basically like these cross connections between like our arteries and our veins or that we call like interstitial fluid or areas around our cells where we can get all of this like metabolic debris, we can get all of these different waste products that are accumulating in fluid. So when we have an underfunctioning lymphatic system, we actually don't get that waste being brought back into circulation to support its elimination. So issues with lymphatics can look like, you know, water retention and swelling or fluid accumulation. Uh, if you like go for a hike and then you're like, man, my wedding ring like won't, won't, <laughs> won't fit or why, why, why are my rings so tight? Um, or standing on your feet all day or flying that you're noticing like that pooling of fluid or that accumulation is just showing like an underfunctioning of that lymphatic system to return this excess, excessive fluid back into circulation for elimination. Um, what I really like about the lymphatic system too, even as we relate it to the immune system is our lymphatic system has little nodes, right? Lymph nodes that harbor our immune cells right? So they're going to have immune cells. So if we're fighting off an infection, those immune cells can go into action and kill off the infection. Then what happens too is like, great, we fought off the infection and there are there's all this what we call pathogenic debris. So there's debris from the bacteria or the virus or the fungus, whatever that our immune system attacked. And now it's just ac accumulated in these lymph nodes, right? So I would say in recovering from illness, in recovering from infection, being able to um, actually look to eliminate or support that lymphatic drainage. So we're getting all of that debris out of, out of our system and then eliminating it eliminating it properly. So I'm, I'm getting some questions just about like how we naturally support these different things. So I'm just going to go through each organ of elimination, and then we can talk about some, some herbs as well. So the bowel, right? Okay. Bowel and having regular bowel movements is very, very important when it comes to detoxification. I will not touch liver health. I will not touch uh, other mechanisms of detoxification if somebody isn't pooping and pooping every day. Um, and constipation, right? That can be classified at like you could be pooping every day, but you could still be constipated, right? Um, are you completely evacuating your bowels? Like, do you feel like you have a full bowel movement when you actually go to the bathroom? right? And it's not just little rabbit pellets. Um, so a perfect, perfect bowel movement. Um, and excuse me, my analogies are always to food. <laughs> I gross out my patients. The size, the shape, and the consistency of a ripe banana, right? That is a fantastic poop, right? Um, no straining um, and then feeling complete after you go. Um, and then depend it, it'll be individual per person i want at least one bowel movement 
a day, but oftentimes it can be maybe two, maybe three, um, because our, our digestive system is a conveyor belt, right? So when we eat, we will look to facilitate a chain reaction along our entire digestive system and then trigger a bowel movement. So sometimes that's why we like uh, when people have dinner, they're like, why am I already having a bowel movement? They're like, wow, that was quick digestion, but that might've been like your breakfast or your lunch. So, um, my kind of key things about supporting regular bowel movements, uh, would be, I, I call it like my four F's, <laughs> uh, fiber. And I see a question about, um, psyllium husks or psyllium fiber. I love psyllium. I think it is a fantastic fiber that you can look to help to, um, you know, constant, concentrate your bowel movements and fiber is going to be really important when it comes to actually like almost taking like scrubbers along your digestive tract, um, to help to eliminate these different, uh, waste products in your bowels. Um, so that's my first F so fiber, and that's not just insoluble fiber, like, psyllium or your metamucil this is coming from your fruits and veggies okay um so this is soluble fiber um so getting remember those antioxidants lots of color so all of your fruits, fruits and veggies is fiber um oh i'm gonna come back to another one of my f's but like so flora or your microflora or your probiotics um, or your bacterial balance within your digestive tract is also important for bowel movements. It's important for bowel signaling um, and actually a bulk majority of your stool is actually dead bacteria. Super great, I know. Um, but though another thing I like to just draw attention to is like prebiotics. Prebiotics is just essentially fiber. Okay, so you can take a regular probiotic or you can eat your fermented foods, but prebiotics are essentially just fibers that feed your bacteria. So I actually don't prescribe or, or give prebiotics to my patients. I give them probiotics and then we focus on other fiber sources. Um, so that's another one of my Fs. Uh, fluid, like I mentioned. So we need we need, we need water for the water slide, right? We need to be able to facilitate um, like a, a decent bowel movement with fluid and with adequate hydration. Um, and then my last is fitness. Okay. So just movement, your bowels won't move if you don't. Okay. So that's really important for supporting bowel function. If you have all of those dialed in and you're still having issues with your bowels or there's undigested food, blood or mucus, you need to talk to your doctor. And if your doctor isn't being helpful, um, they they said, there's nothing I can do for you. Eat some fiber and, and, and you're bloated all the time. Um, speak with somebody like a naturopathic doctor, we, this kind of like the keystone of our practice. Like we all, we all focus on digestion. Digestion is kind of the keystone of, of, of naturopathic medicine. Absolutely. Um, there was a question about leaky gut. Um, how do you heal leaky gut? Totally dependent on the person. Um, we, <laughs> totally dependent on the person. We have to figure out what the cause is in terms of leaky gut. Um, there may be strategic um, nutritional changes that help to support that. Um, there may be specific probiotics or um, nutraceuticals or plant mechanisms or, or constituents that help to heal that as well. Um, so again, it's, it's totally dependent on, on the individual, but definitely finding the source is gonna be appropriate. Okay, so I just wanna, um, uh, somebody says ground flax oil has been very helpful. Absolutely, I love ground flax. Um, a ground flax oil can be supportive. Um, there are some, you know, really great um, teas that are beneficial. Um, and then again, we're gonna talk about some, some herbs a little later. I'm gonna put a pin in uh, the liver because I feel like we're gonna cover this a little bit more um, when it comes to, uh, different herbs that help to support that. Um, but the biggest thing is again, 
not stressing about how do we detoxify that organ, but understanding like where are my obstacles or where are my sources of stress on, on my liver? Um, so if we're looking at like fatty liver disease and, and looking at nutrition and how to reduce that um, and maybe reducing alcohol or sugar consumption, again, all of those things can be uh, supportive of your liver because if it's not bogged down by all of these other responsibilities, then it can just focus on, okay, I'm just need to detoxify lactose acid. I need to detoxify um, the breakdown of cholesterol and my blood products and my hormones and all of these things, as opposed to being like bogged down and burdened by um, things that we're putting on or in our body. Uh, kidneys and lungs, I mentioned hydration, hydration, hydration. Um, and then when it comes to um, lungs, breathing. And I know that sounds so silly, um, but deep belly breathing, like appropriate breath, um, fascinating studies when it comes to detoxification, your body is detoxifying all the time, right? And your kidney and your lungs are really responsible and work in conjunction with one another to regulate your minerals and your gases in your blood. So all of our different buffer systems of how enzymes work in our body. So, uh, kidneys and lungs, again, breathing. I know it sounds silly, but like deep belly breathing also really fantastic. If you do like breathing practices or what they call pranayama techniques, uh, you can Google like alter altered nostril breathing or, um, like box breathing. There's lots of really good options. Um, and interesting and cool data when it comes to regular breathing and detoxification and weight loss. Fascinating fascinating stuff. So don't under appreciate those things. Uh, lymphatics and skin. Um, so like I said, uh, root of elimination, root of exposure. Um, so definitely examining the things that we're putting on our, on our skin. Um, when it comes to fragrance, when it comes to again, laundry detergent, all of our personal care products, uh, lymphatics. Um, I, I work with, you know, interesting population where it's, you know, some young moms and, and things like, or moms of young children and, uh, sometimes like physical activity or being like, you need to exercise 30 minutes a day, um, to, to move your lymph. So I just tell people move your lymph every single day. So for some people that, that is going to be, you know, cardio or, or activity for some people, um, that might be like getting a good sweat in, in whatever way possible. So maybe that is a sauna. Um, maybe it's contrast therapy. So I'm like, if you have time to shower, sometimes moms don't, <laughs> but like, if you have time to shower at the very end, turn, turn it down to cold. And that contrast in, and, and always ending on cold, but that contrast in temperature is what is going to support recirculation to the skin. And, and, and so that recirculation is kind of acting like a pump in the lymphatic region to help to flush out that, that system as well. Um, the, there's something else I want to say, oh, dry brushing is a really good option as well. So using a soft bristle brush and mobilizing lymphatic um, fluid back towards the heart, lymphatic massage, massage in general. And again, like I said, activity or just movement is gonna move your lymph. So move your lymph every day. And then we talked a bit about the, the uterus. Okay, I think before I, I jet into um, some herbs, so I just want to be mindful of time here. Before I jet into some herbs, there are some some questions. Um, so lemon water question mark thoughts on better hydration. Um, I like lemon water to to kickstart digestion. Um, so like lemon water first thing in the morning, I think is fantastic because acid promotes acid. So then when we ingest something, um, and lemon water is interesting because it's both acidic and alkaline. Um, so lemon water first thing in the morning, going to stimulate um, stomach acid. When we stimulate stomach acid, we're going to promote better digestive enzymes. So we're kind of kickstarting our digestion for the day. Um, I really like the taste of it. I find it very refreshing. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to always add lemon to your water. Um, but I think like incorporating lemon water or like, um, 
tablespoon of organic concentrate of lemon is really fantastic for like, especially that kind of kickstart. Um, if you are going to be consuming it throughout the day, make sure you're rinsing out your mouth because the acid on your enamel can actually wear down your teeth. Um, so I just like to, um, make my, my patients aware of that. And then when it comes to, um, it being alkaline, it actually, the way the minerals are processed through the body, um, it helps to promote better alkalinity of the system. And we know that, um, things that are more acidic, like high sugar can, can be, uh, can cause inflammation within our system. So making sure we're eating our vegetables are again, a nice mechanism of, um, promoting that alkalinity within our system. Um, would apple cider vinegar be the same thing in water in the morning? Yes, absolutely. Um, so apple cider vinegar, same thing, same mechanism. Um, acid promotes acid. Um, so people sometimes do apple cider vinegar as a shot. Um, my preference is just lemon water. I'm not a, I only use apple cider vinegar in my cooking. I don't really love the taste of it. Um, so I, I tend to just be more so drawn to lemon water or, or herbal bitters is, is also one of my faves. Uh, okay. Uh, so we haven't heard of washing vegetables and baking soda before. What does the baking soda do and how much do you recommend? Um, there were some studies done, I think in 2012, um, and supposedly it helps to deactivate some of the pesticides and herbicides. I don't really understand the, the mechanism of it. Um, I think from like, a, um, uh, a, a mineral perspective, it inactivates, you know, some of the um, chemical composition of the pesticides, herbicides. Um, and there are ratios online that tell you like how much baking soda per water to use. Um, I just kind of free, free ball it. I fill a uh, container with water, put in baking soda, and then just rinse my, my, my veggies and my fruits in there. Um, there's also different washes and things like that. Um, okay. So with so many various products out there from Gatorade to electrolytes, coconut water to replenish electrolytes, do you have a favorite you would recommend? Um, not really. Like I would say, um, a lot of the, like, I don't really love like the, the Gatorades and like the prefabbed, um, stuff, because even when you look when you look at the product and it's like this neon blue color, it looks cool. I don't really want to be drinking that. Um, I find like pretty decent, um, electrolyte mixes, like, the like different fitness brands actually have pretty decent electrolytes. Um, and we're looking at potentially like some magnesium, some calcium, some potassium, again, or some sodium as well. Um, so finding a really balanced mineral composition, um, and making sure there aren't like a tiny ton of junky additives. Um, some people really love the, the Noom um, products. Um, personally, I don't have, have a favorite, just whatever works for people. Sometimes people like the fizzy things. Um, some people just add, um, you know, sea salt uh, to their water or there's different, there's again, different like uh, natural aids or like a, a natural Gatorade version online too. But um, yeah, I don't really have a brand preference. Uh, Okay, uh, leaky gut, I answered that. Uh, so what if your kidneys are not working properly to eliminate, how do you detox? Great question. So that's why we have all of these various organs of elimination. So when the kidneys are under functioning, uh, that's when we look to other mechanisms of how can we eliminate fluid from the body. So I would say sweating may actually be a really good option for some people. Again, chat with your doctor because sometimes people with kidney issues have associated cardiovascular or health issues that may, again, may mean they can't do certain therapies, but definitely sweating is going to be important when, when kidneys are under functioning. Um, and then remember how your kidneys are really linked to your lungs. So looking at your lung tissue, right? So how can we breathe and uh, look to detoxify that way? Mm. Uh, how long would you suggest staying inside a barrel sauna? Is there a limit? I have no idea what a barrel sauna, sauna is. I have never heard of that before. 
Uh, my husband and I do approximately 20 minutes every weekend and sit outside to naturally cool the body. That's cool. I find a lot of like more intensive sauna therapy. 20 minutes is around the time that people are targeting for. Again, some people have to build up to that heat tolerance. They may only do five minutes um, one day and then kind of work their way up. If you're getting he um, lightheaded, uh, or you find that you're almost getting like heart palpitations, or you can feel like your heart rate increasing significantly, um, or to a dis uh, uncomfortable level. Um, I would say that's probably too long, but again, that, that contrast of, um, you know, sitting outside, uh, especially in the winter or doing like a cool dip or a cool shower is, is fantastic, but I've never heard of a barrel sauna. I don't know the, um, the technology behind that. Uh, so what if my fingers are always swollen? Uh, there may be an issue with fluid accumulation. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the herbs that might be helpful. Uh, what are some of the best ways to help a toddler poop? Uh, depends on the age, depends on the um, where you're at in food introduction. Um, but I would say definitely like fibrous foods uh, and puree based things prunes can be really helpful. Um, and if it's like a really bad issue, um, with constipation, um, herbal recommendations, uh, like restore relax off the shelf. Um, or if there's, um, you know, working with a practitioner who can recommend specific herbs for your kiddo and the, and the dosage for that, um, there's, there's also options to get them pooping more. But remember my, my F's, those are those, if you're focusing on those four F's, you'll fix a lot of problems. Um, do you think that colon cleanses can be part of a healthy cleanse or necessarily? Oops. Oh, I was playing with my AirPods. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Okay. Okay. Excellent. I know my AirPods connect in like, okay, perfect. Okay. So, um, do you think that colon cleanses can be part of a healthy cleanse or are they unnecessarily and potentially even harmful? I would say it depends on the colon cleanse. Um, there are some, uh, herbs that don't, that some individuals should not use. Um, and so, and I don't tend to recommend stimulant laxatives or herbs that then create a bowel dependency, right? For me, it's all about how can I eliminate your obstacle to healing and how can I eliminate um, your how can I support your body's natural way of being, right? And what I really want to get across is that you have everything you need, right? Unless you have a disease or a pathology that inhibits these different processes, your body is detoxifying all the time. And it's just about making sure we're not filling that bucket as quickly. And how can we support these organ systems from a lifestyle perspective, or if we're looking for a bit more supported detoxification that we can accomplish it, it that way. Um, so potentially, yeah, they can be harmful, especially if there's um, um, lots of bowel inflammation. Um, somebody could be at risk for sepsis, which means um, bacteria can enter into your bloodstream and then it becomes a blood infection. Um, again, I'm, I'm talking about like worst case kind of scenarios, but my, my preference is just like that support, um, supportive detoxification, um, and not creating a dependency. Um, so people need to take something for, for the rest of their life. Uh, okay. So I'm taking medication. How safe is it to use herbs to cleanse or detoxify at the same time? Uh, well, we're going to talk about some herbs. Um, the best thing with any type of medication, the, the, um, cautions and warnings on our labeling is actually quite good. Um, health Canada has really strict, um, guidelines on, on labeling and things we can or cannot put on labels. Um, but if it's ever in question, please always consult your doctor. And I can't speak to every medication or every case or every herb. Um, so speak to somebody who understands medication and understands botanical medicine and um, naturopathic medicine is a nice bridge there. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts around taking Relaxa to promote bowel movements? Uh, is that a trade name of something, Relaxa? I don't know if that person is still on here. 
I don't know the mechanism of relaxa. Um, if relaxa is a, there are different um, laxatives called osmotic laxatives, which basically means it pulls water into the intestinal tract to facilitate a bowel movement. So this is something like um, Restorlax can have this effect. Um, there's also like magnesium citrate can have this effect. Um, so when people talk about, oh, I can't take magnesium, it always makes me poop. Um, check the format. It might be the citrate because citrate as a molecule is going to pull um, stuff into the intestinal intestinal tract uh, or pull water into the intestinal tract to facilitate a bowel movement. Um, but I'm not quite sure with Relaxa. They might have a different trade name. Uh, hey, hey, Dr. Brianna. Oh, I, yeah. just, I just searched it. It's, it's an osmos, osmotic. Relaxative. Yeah. Yeah. And then somebody just popped in the chat, Restore Relax. Yeah. 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 Restore Relax is an osmotic laxative. Yeah. So it's going to pull water into the digestive tract. Yeah. So that was just a typo. No problem. Uh, okay. Okay, there's some questions in there. So again, if I if you need to me to re-answer a question, might be able to, to pop it in the chat. So what I'll do is I'm just gonna go through a couple herb products and then we'll leave some time for questions, um, especially some of the ones that have been popping up in the chat that Johnny might be able to, to help me um, field or anything that I missed. Again, if you have a question um, that's new or a question that I haven't addressed, you can always pop it in the Q&A box as well. And it just um, keeps track of them a little bit more effectively for me. Okay. So milk thistle, I would say is probably like the Holy grail. And like one of my favorite products, when it, one of my favorite herbs, when it comes to supported detoxification. Now milk thistle is going to work. It does have other me plant mechanisms, but one of the primary actions is that it's going to support liver function. And one of the coolest things about the liver, it has the capacity to regenerate itself. We can actually create new liver cells. So when we look at milk thistle and some of the studies on, on supporting liver health, A, it helps to tonify and support the liver. Um, and what I mean by that is that it actually helps to regenerate liver cells. Um, it is a fantastic antioxidant for the liver. It can reduce fibrosis in, in the liver or fibrotic tissue. Um, it could, I don't, I'm not sure if I said it reduces inflammation at the liver level. It is a fantastic antioxidant at the liver level, and it's going to be supporting um, detoxification or several liver pathways. Now we have multiple stages of liver detoxification, and milk thistle is going to support the liver as a whole. And then I'm not, some people may have heard about like glutathione and glutathione is like a big buzzword in, um, uh, detoxification and, uh, anti-aging or aging gracefully, however you want to classify that. Um, but milk thistle actually helps to regenerate our own production of glutathione. Super cool. So glutathione will work on different phases of liver metabolism. And glutathione is one of the most like potent antioxidants that we make, right? We make glutathione, right? Um, so milk thistle is a means or a way to um, help support that. Milk thistle is also very gentle and very safe. Um, milk thistle um, is meant to or can be taken uh, long term. So I really like it that way. Um, and then milk thistle is uh, the, the nature of the constituents or the nature of the different like fatty acids and that kind of thing in milk thistle um, need an extraction component. They need a solvent. Um, so milk thistle tea not super effective. Like you would have to crush and concentrate and like it, it's laborious, um, very, very hard to extract those constituents in a tea. Um, so we're either looking to use in an alcohol as a solvent. So making a tincture, um, or we're looking at like a concentrated, um, capsule, um, such as ours, we have a, a really nice five to one. And by using this solvent or using this extraction component, we're gaining that valuable, what we call a silymarin complex. So silymarin is the active ingredient in that 
Um, so I have, oh, thanks. Uh, thank, thanks for staying. Uh, and uh, I, I know this is recorded as well. Um, okay, so milk thistle can be used all year long. Um, like I said, it's very quite safe and quite gentle. Again, you can always consult with your physician if you have certain medications, especially medications that use different liver pathways um, that there is a theoretical interaction with, um, but few and far between um, uh, contraindications that I really come across. I'd say like the biggest um, caution and warning is if people are allergic to, to that plant family. But, uh, so I really, really, really like milk thistle. Uh, so hepato DR, hepato DR is a formulation um, that is a synergistic multi-herb formula to support liver detoxification. So it is hinge and relying on everything that we talked about when it comes to milk thistle um, and then its active constituent uh, silymarin. Uh, and it has other what we call hepatic or liver herbs, uh, such as dandelion, such as globe artichoke, which you can see the beautiful um, picture on the package there, that's globe artichoke, um, organ grape and wild yam. So all of these herbs are looking to support the various pathways of how the liver detoxifies. And they also promote the production of bile. So bile is a natural product that we make in the liver concentrates in the gallbladder and then is released when we have food, right? So um, bile is really helpful for digesting fat, but as a secondary um, supportive thing for bile is that it can help with detoxification. So um, really fantastic and supporting our natural metabolism or breakdown of our hormones. So um, like I said, I work in, in quite a bit in women's health. So if somebody isn't necessarily metabolizing or breaking down their hormones as effectively, um, and we're seeing issues with either like hormonal acne or we're having issues with um, heavy menstrual bleeding or painful menstrual bleeding. Um, it might be based on that we're not properly metabolizing those hormones and they're just kind of coming back into circulation and having like an amplified effect. Um, so hepato DR, really fantastic formulation. Um, and if somebody was looking to do, uh, so this can be taken long-term. Um, if somebody was wanting to do more of like a supportive detoxification, they're like, okay, it's, it's springtime. Let's just do, um, again, a little supportive detoxification, uh, for like you do one round, you do one bottle or you do a couple rounds or a couple months. Um, I think that's also totally appropriate. So some people, um, might do this like four times a year, um, kind of like with every season change, or some people are using it more long-term because they have those underlying difficulties with detoxification. So, um, maybe somebody who does struggle with hormonal issues or acne or or, or things like that, where we might, or, or they don't have a gallbladder. So we need some, some extra bile support, um, or issues with digesting fat, that kind of thing that hepato DR, you know, might be, um, you know, another thing that we, um, uh, utilize. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm seeing that you're sending me questions. I'm just quickly going through the, the products. Um, and then I'll, um, I'll get to your question. So I'm sorry there. Okay. Um, I know I'm, I know I'm going over time, but, uh, I'm just going to wrap up these products quick and then I'll, 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 I'll stay on additionally for some questions. So castor oil, castor oil is fantastic when it comes to increasing local circulation and amplifying this internal organ function and looking to kind of like flush the tissue. Uh, so it's not like our, our parents or our grandparents generation, uh, where they would ingest it. I actually don't recommend taking castor oil internally. Um, but we get really great, um, mechanism, really great effects using it topically or, or on the skin. So it's a really unique fatty acid in that it both loves water and it both loves fat. So meaning that, uh, it has a high propensity to actually be quite well absorbed through the skin. So fat loving, right. It'll actually go into the skin. And then because it is also water loving, it's actually going to draw circulation to it. So when we increase circulation, we increase function. 
right? Um, and then there's a ricin component that gently irritates that tissue. So then we draw even more circulation there as well. So castor oil can be applied over lymph nodes, right? So if we have inflamed lymph nodes and we want to increase circulation and increase that flushing effect, that could be a good option. Uh, some people put it over top of their liver. So your liver is on your right hand side, just tucked under your rib cage. So some people will put castor oil on over top of their liver to increase circulation, therefore increase function of their liver. Um, so it, some people put it on strains, sprains, those kinds of things as well. Again, we increase circulation we increase um, metabolism and flushing of those fluids. Um, castor oil is really thick and sticky. Um, so some people recommend like castor oil packs. I find that incredibly tedious. Um, I get people, so if they're doing like a liver pack, uh, use a small amount, like a uh, dime size or less, um, pop it over top of the liver, like rub it into your skin, throw on a junky t-shirt. That's something that you don't mind getting stained. Uh, you can put a hot water bottle on it or just go to bed and then it should absorb into the skin overnight. If it's not, you probably use too much. And so some people are doing this like every other night. Um, maybe they're doing this twice a week. Um, again, kind of the indication of, of what we're, what we're trying to use it for. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide because we did talk about lymph uh, as, as a function, um, but as a product. Um, so lymph tonic is our lymphatic support. So this used to be called um, uh, laprinol. And so this is a very multifaceted lymphatic support where we're looking to promote lymphatic flow. So some people who have issues with um, you know, water retention, difficulties with circulation, um, fluid, fluid accumulation, congestion, um, potentially some skin issues, um, and supporting the natural flushing of the lymph fluid, um, and aiding in detoxification there. So, um, this is looking to support lymphatic function and helping to remove those different uh, various uh, cellular wastes. Um, this one does have um, a few more contraindications with it. Um, and so I don't typically recommend this long-term or if you are using this long-term, making sure that you're consulting with somebody who's familiar um, with these products, like a herbalist, nutritionist, um, the, who has extensive herbal training or, or naturopathic doctor. Um, cause like I mentioned, there are a few, um, uh, immune related disorders or, um, things that may contraindicate use for this. Um, and so if you are, I, I do recommend it, this being more for like the supportive detoxification. So you could actually use it alongside of the hepato DR. You could use it alongside the, the milk thistle but then you'd be rotating it. So, um, maybe it'd be like one bottle and then you take a two week break. Um, again, kind of working with somebody, if you are looking to support that long-term, but otherwise you could certainly do it seasonally again, like two to four times a year, especially if, um, your, your Achilles or your issue, um, is it tends to be, um, uh, more, more an issue related to, um, the lymph system. And, and the reasoning that I'm saying, like more contraindications and things like that associated with it is that some people with lymph issues or appears to be fluid accumulation issues are related to more serious conditions, right? Related to kidney issues, related to heart issues. So making sure that those things aren't, are, are being addressed appropriately and that we're not actually interfering with any medications or, or treatments for you. Um, clear glow is more, uh, so it is a bit of a lymphatic support, but it's also what we call alternative in action where it's a lymphatic, but it also works on another organ of elimination, such as the liver. So burdock is a really fantastic herb in here. So we're getting detoxification of the lymphatic system, detoxification of the, of the liver. And oftentimes it's really, really supportive or beneficial when it comes to issues with the skin. So so, uh, mild acne, eczema, psoriasis, uh, again, that this could be a really good option uh, for support. Um, and again, a few contraindications there. So uh, like I said, our um, labeling is really good there, or just consult with somebody um, who could recommend these products. Okay.
All right. So I know I, I'm over time. I apologize. Um, I wish to respect your time. So I want to come back to questions. Um, but before you jet off, I just wanted to say thank you so much for attending. Thank you be, for asking such great questions. Uh, and if you want to stay on, um, I'll stay on uh, till half past um, to answer any questions. Um, and, and I'm happy to do that. So I'm just going to pop into the Q&A first. Um, and if there's any kind of like straggling uh, questions that I didn't address in the chat, then I can, can get to that. Uh, so how can I eliminate calcium crystals that accumulate in my knee and ankle joints? What would you recommend? Um, so hard to answer that. And I can't necessarily give medical advice. Um, it's discovering why these calcium crystals are depositing in, in these joints. So is it related to, um, chronic overuse or injury? Is it related to the food that you're eating or is it inflammation? Um, so the treatment would totally be directed at, um, yeah, why you're having these calcium crystals deposit. Um, also, is it calcium crystals depositing in the kidney? Is the kidney related to this? Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really answer uh, that question. It's a little bit um, challenging without knowing the whole, the whole case and the cause. Okay, uh, how long should one take milk thistle? I would say a minimum a month, right? So if you are just looking to incorporate milk thistle, either as a su supportive detoxification um, or kind of seasonally look, looking to support overall liver function. Um, for me, I'm, I'm typically recommending it. Like if we're using it to support a certain condition, um, say like we're working on acne and we're incorporating other mechanisms of supporting or reducing acne breakouts, I might use, use it for three months consecutively consecutively and then be reassessing if that's the most appropriate treatment for them. Um, but I would say like milk thistle can be used long-term, but I would say to, to use it at least a month, it might not be one of those things where you notice a drastic difference because, um, it's that internal processing or it's just supporting liver function. Um, so you, you may not notice like a huge, some people it's like, oh, that like hungover effect or that like flu like effect is totally gone. Um, I've had some patients say that where they're, they're on it for like a month and they notice a, a difference. So, um, and that might mean, are we eliminating what's actually causing that in the first place? Um, or is the milk thistle enough to just kind of shift your body back into like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Hey, Dr. Brianna, can we get yeah. to some of the questions uh, that were in the chat uh, mm -hmm. before some mm -hmm. of these questions in Q&A? Mm -hmm. um, so one of them was, um, I recall that flax is high in estrogen, question mark. Uh, so good question. So uh, flax is a plant estrogen. Um, and what it actually looks to do is balance estrogen in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, number one, um, flax is also high in uh, something called flavolignans that increases a protein in your blood that's actually going to quench extra hormones. So um, rather than those hormones kind of floating around in your blood and then have, working on a target tissue and causing these hormonal issues, we're quenching them to these proteins so then they can float in the blood and be used when, when they need. When we incorporate things like different plant estrogens, our own estrogens in our system and um, endocrine disrupting or fake estrogens in the environment bind to our receptors very tightly. So when we incorporate different plant estrogens or things that look very similar to estrogen in our system, they can actually bind to the receptor, but loosely. So what it does is if we have a lot or too much estrogen in the system, it blocks the more potent estrogen from binding to that receptor. Or if we don't have enough estrogen in our system, the flax can actually bind to that receptor and then have a, a lowered effect, um, but also a significant effect when it comes to um, estrogen action within the body. So flax is good for low estrogen. Flax is good for high estrogen. Uh, next question. A few drops of lemon oil 
does it do the same as lemon juice in the water? Um, so lemon oil is a, it's a very like lemon essential oil is a very concentrated volatile oil. So you're not necessarily getting the acid from lemon that still has that acid promotes acid, um, incorporation when we're looking to upregulate digestion, when you're using lemon oil, um, internally, uh, mostly volatile oils work to calm the digestive tract. So if there's like spasming or cramping or like intestinal pain or bloating, then they can alleviate that. Um, similarly to other volatile oils, like, um, fennel and and I'm, I'm more so talking about in teas as opposed to essential oil. Um, so that could, that that's how the, the lemon oil would work internally. Personally, I don't, um, kind of across the board, I don't recommend essential oils internally, unless I have a very specific purpose or reasoning to do that. And oftentimes it's killing, it's killing stuff off. It's killing off, off bacteria or yeast or fungus. Um, as opposed to like using it to support digestion because volatile oils can, can kill off our, our um, digestive flora. Uh, my mother has lots of mucus, post-nasal drips as well. Most comes from dehydration and some types of food. How to help her that has more than seven years suffering? Yeah. Uh, lots of mucus. So the body is going to lay down mucus in response to inflammation right? So mucus is the body's protective way of laying down uh, a means to protect inflamed tissue. Um, there are certain foods that are what we call mucogenic or create mucus. Dairy is a food group, unfortunately. I know we love cheese. Dairy is a food group, unfortunately, actually promotes or creates mucus in the body. So singers, actors won't <laughs> have dairy before a scene or before a show. Um, so the biggest thing is like what is causing or triggering the inflammation. So sometimes it's different food sensitivities that can be um, a mechanism of that um, post nasal drip or allergic rhinitis or things in allergies. So I'm suspicious that there's some type of unaddressed allergy, uh, whether that be food, whether that be environmental. Um, so looking to means to reduce the inflammation and then also look at um, causes um, or regulating or balance the, balancing the immune system, especially if it's like that chronic rhinitis or post-nasal drip, something like allergy relief from St. Francis might be a good option. Um, but again, it's figuring out that, that trigger. Um, I think this question goes back to um, bowel movements in children. So a three-year-old and prunes aren't helping. Can kids take bitters? Um, depends on the bitter. Like I wouldn't necessarily recommend like the Canadian bitters formulation. Um, there are some more mild bitters like chamomile is actually a, a fantastic bitter and it stimulates something called the migratory motor complex. So that could be useful. Um, Restorolax or those different osmotic laxatives can be supportive. Um, and then, yeah, making sure, like, if the fiber is there, make sure the fluid's there. But it might be um, either an imbalance in bacteria or an underfunctioning thing that is is triggering the the motility response. So it could be, you know, a pr probiotic component that might be useful. What about detoxing for acne? Oh, acne is like the hardest because <laughs> acne can come from digestion. Acne can come from your hormones. Acne can come from that like liver congestion and lymphatic congestion um, uh, congestion that we talked about. Uh, acne can also be from um, altered microbial balance on the skin. Um, so if somebody has kind of um, ruined their, their acid mantle on their skin with like unfortunately, like harsh sh stripping, um, uh, products that people with acne are usually put on, um, detoxifying for acne. I would say like clear glue might be a good option. Um, you might look at like milk thistle long-term because milk thistle can also support, um, uh, that protein that floats around in the blood to help bind those excess hormones. So sometimes there's like kind of a dual benefit there. So I'd say milk thistle or the clear glow might be a good option.
I have constant digestive problems, heartburn, always every day after food. Sometimes I feel like fer- fermentation and blogging my stomach. Mm. What can I do to help? Okay. Uh, bitters might be a good option. And I know it's like slightly counterintuitive with um, uh, that it that bitters will actually promote acid production. Sometimes people with heartburn, it's less about that they're producing too much acid and it's more about that they're not producing enough to actually get the closing of um that that muscle on top of their of their stomach and supporting digestive function with like creating better you know stomach acid digestive enzymes to break down those foods or that fermentation um that could be useful sometimes it might be related to a condition called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth where like literally you have too much bacteria and they are fermenting and it feels like there's that fermentation process um so that would just have to get uh worked up but you might be able to incorporate you know a digestive enzyme or you might be able to utilize bitters to actually promote better um digestive health uh there's three questions on milk thistle uh so one, one um if you have liver disease can you take milk thistle um can we use milk thistle all year long and is milk thistle something that should be used in low doses as a preventative or support supplement? Yeah. So um, I'll answer the dose and the timing question. So dosing um, like dep- depends on what we're trying to accomplish. If it's kind of just a low, like a, like a maintenance thing, you're doing that long-term, you can stick on the lower end of the like reference range for dosing, whether that be, um, the, the capsule or the tincture. Um, and like I said, it can be used long-term. I don't know if there was another question around the, the time frame. if you can clarify, Johnny. Uh, if it can be taken like all year, yes. Yeah, yeah. All, all year long. Yeah. All year long. Yeah, absolutely. It can be taken all year long. Um, and then people with liver disease depends on the liver disease. Um, and if they're on like any medications or things like that, um, actually really good studies in um, supporting liver regeneration and reversing fibrosis. So whether that be related to um, like liver fibrosis, whether this be related to chronic um hep B and C, um, infections that are then affecting the liver. So I can answer definitively depending on the condition and depending off their, if they're on any other medications, but there's been pretty serious or chronic health conditions that have been improved with milk thistle. So it might be something that they ask their doctor about if they can incorporate. Uh, would any of these products, uh, be related to ragweed family? Mm. Uh, I don't, I'm trying to think of milk thistle is in, no, milk thistle is a funny one. Um, I would double check with the, um, the lymph tonic because there's a lot of herbs in there. And, um, I don't know if there is another one from a ragweed allergy and the, um, I can't remember what plant family milk thistle is in. Uh, I feel like it's, um, Asteraceae actually. So I don't think it's a ragweed issue, but for the allergies, I think we're pretty good about putting it on, on the label. So I would just verify and double check. Yeah. If someone is low in adrenal, can one go on liver detox? Um, with low adrenal function, I, and this is why, like, I like to clarify between cleanse and supported detoxification. When somebody has altered or decreased adrenal function, we don't want to be pushing other systems, right? So a really stringent cleanse is not going to be supportive for adrenal function. A supported detox, like putting somebody on milk thistle, absolutely. That would be totally fine on, on lowered adrenal function. Um, but I would say like those conventional cleanses, like two weeks and and you're by the toilet for two days would not be a, another reason why I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. Um, something like uh hepato DR again, very like 
gentle and supportive as opposed to purgative. So I think that would be appropriate and fine. Yeah. Would castor oil pack work for lipoma? Uh, yes, I've had some good success with lipoma um, and making sure that it is um, been assessed. Like it's not any like liposarcoma or there's any um, cancer risk or that there are any issues um, with that issue. If it's like a fatty accumulation, um, lipoma is different, like skin, like those kinds of things. Um, castor oil is totally fine. Is castor oil good to rub on your leg if you feel swelling from sitting or standing too long? Is it okay if you have vicarious veins? varicose veins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fine to rim on legs. If it's been swelling too long. Um, the sometimes it's based on the accumulation of the lactic acid. So it might be looking at how do we support the lactic acid removal? So it might actually be looking more so at liver health. It might actually just be even like fatigue of the muscle, right? So it might be even like magnesium or something is, is a bit more supportive. Um, sometimes if the body isn't capable of dealing with that lactic acid, and then we're promoting that um, detoxification or uh, increase in function with the castor oil uh, may make it feel a little bit more achy, right? Um, yeah, sometimes people can overdo it with the castor oil. So looking at why you're not moving that lactic acid. Uh, the question is, will this help with shingles? I'm not sure what product that was referring yeah, to. Yeah, I don't know at what point the question was asked. Um, uh, any of the products, just thinking with shingles, um, shingles is a viral infection of the nerve. Um, so the biggest support for shingles is going to be, um, treating the virus and supporting the immune system. Uh, once the infection is mitigated, that might be something that we use like lymph support, right? Where we're actually mobilizing and, um, taking away that, um, debris that's associated with, um, the infection. So, um, I would say, yeah, heart, those would be product recommendations or, or what not to take too. What are the four F's again? Uh, so four F's for your feces or your bowel movements, uh, fiber, fluid, fitness, as in you have to move your body and flora as in bacteria. I heard there's a difference between supporting the liver with milk thistle, for instance, and drain liver ducts where stones can form. Is that right? If so, what can we do for bile ducts drainage in liver and gallbladder? Yeah. So good question. The milk thistle is going to support overall function and more so we're seeing it from like the detoxification standpoint. When we're looking at like bile and like liver and gallbladder with bile production, it's more so related to the digestive system and digestive triggers. Um, so when people have either like sluggish bile or gallstones or accumulation, um, I'm would be potentially utilizing something like hepato DR that is going to support um, regular bile production and flow. That might not be the case for some people with gallstones that you can actually, I, I don't necessarily want to mobilize gallstones, but definitely supporting bile production um, for more of like sluggish or sludgy bile, um, hepato DR would probably be my go-to, but I don't do a lot of gallbladder flushes. That is not, that's not something I do in practice. Uh, his, is hepato uh, safe to use for people on medication? Uh, it depends on the medication. Some medications are metabolized through the kidney. Um, some medications are metabolized through different liver um, pathways. So um, again, you'd have to speak to your prescribing physician or somebody who's familiar with the, the mechanism of elimination. 
Sometimes, and again, depending on the type of medication, it may be simply that you're taking them at different times. So I have patients who take Synthroid in the morning and they do HepatoDR or milk thistle at night. Um, and that might be a completely appropriate, but again, depends on the medication and depends on the, um, so they would just need to consult with their physician. Would any of these products help for adult postmenopausal acne? Um, the, again, it depends on the trigger, right? So acne could be related to digestive function, could be related to hormones, could be related to liver function and health. Um, possibly the hepato DR or even like the clear glow, um, may be beneficial with postmenopausal acne. Again, if we think about like the milk thistle, um, milk thistle may have more benefit when it comes to like um, a lower estrogen state. It can work kind of similarly to flaxseed, um, not necessarily as like a true plant estrogen, but it can have very similar effects in supporting or balancing estrogen levels. Um, so I would say milk thistle, hepato DR, or clear glow might be a good option. Are lignans and flax okay for men trying to boost testosterone and muscle mass? Um, yes, I, I think that, um, you would have to take a lot of flax to actually, uh, sequester or render testosterone in men to, um, that, that significant of a level. Um, if you're doing like therapeutically, like two, ta like two tablespoons of flaxseed a day, uh, you shouldn't have an issue with your, um, testosterone in, in, in your gains and things like that. No. Nope. Um, I had asked about colon cleanses. Thanks for your response and good info, but I was referring to colon flush, colon hydrotherapy and wondering if that really helps to detox and cleanse the colon or if it is necessary or even dangerous. Um, I, some people love them, um, and find them hugely beneficial. Um, I, I don't use them in practice. I don't necessarily recommend them in practice. Again, the, the contraindications or the dangers of doing it would be more so if somebody would be susceptible to infection or there's digestive inflammation, um, there might be options or there might be benefits to doing it if there's specific um, infections that aren't being resolved. So some people I know swear by them because um, they had a parasitic infection and it helped to, to clear it out. Um, I, again, kind of speak more so from the standpoint of um, how do we support our body in, in, in doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so I've never, I, an enema, sometimes people look at enema where you're just looking at like the rectum and like the first part of the colon. Um, if there's issues with either constipation or being more congested in that area of the colon, um, if somebody, it, it may be indicated if somebody has like chronic, um, dysbiosis or like a recurring infection that's never resolved. Um, but I, I don't necessarily routinely recommend them. Um, or there might be issues, like pregnancy, obviously be contraindicated and that kind of thing. So, um, I, I'm on the, I'm on the fence. I'm, I'm kind of impartial. Yeah. What are the non-stimulant herbs to help with elimination of waste from the bowel? Okay. So, um, non-stimulant herbs. So a lot of what's in the, our bitters formulation or any herb that has like bitter qualities or looking to support bile production, um, things that we're more so seeing like dependency on are going to be like your, your, um, uh, your cast, like your senas and those kinds of things where you can actually, um, create a reliance to that. Uh, and then, oh, sorry, you can ask the next question. Uh, will any of these products you mentioned assist with seasonal allergies? Mm, milk thistle can, for sure. Um, milk thistle can look to reduce histamine. Um, that is hugely beneficial. It kind of works similarly to, to nettles. Um, so I would say from like a seasonal allergy perspective, the milk thistle would be my, my go-to, but we have other products like allergy relief or deep immune that are, are in a new nasal spray that is quite good too. 
Uh, when dry brushing, do you start from the foot up or head down? Uh, foot up and always back towards the heart. In regards to diet, is there a diet, either vegan, GAPS diet, AIP, that promote detoxification more than other diets? Some say vegan with no fat. Some say GAPS. I don't know who to believe anymore. <laughs> Nutrition gets complicated very quickly and everybody is on like different sides of the fence. I would say um, there, the, I would say probably one of the most balanced diets out there is the Mediterranean diet. You're eating a ton of vegetables and fruits. You have lean proteins, um, modest red meat or saturated fats, high and healthy fats, polysaturated fats, super high in antioxidants, which again, uh, we talked about antioxidants from um, the standpoint of preventing this oxidative stress, but antioxidants also work on liver metabolism, right? They fuel these different pathways to promote this optimal detoxification. Um, and uh, also a lot of these diets like keto or um, AIP or um, I can't remember the other really low Atkins they don't have a ton of fiber. So when you don't have fiber, you're not pooping properly. So then you get a build of a toxicity. So I don't really think that those are necessarily like good diets for detoxification. So I'd say, yeah, ton of fruits and ton of veggies and fruits, like, um, complex carbohydrates, um, lean proteins, healthy fats, and like lots of color and, and the occasional glass of red wine, right? You get that on the Mediterranean <laughs> diet as well. Um, how to best eliminate lactic acid from muscle after hard workout? Also, what can help recover from pulled muscle? Okay, so uh, recovery from pulled muscle, um, protein, making sure you're giving the body those key nutrients for rebuilding. Um, and then other, yeah, so uh, protein and making sure that you're supporting those natural mechanisms of healing, like sleep is a big thing too. Uh, a lot of times with like overtraining or, um, injuries, um, we're seeing it as an under nutrition, right? We're not getting significant calories and, and most often we're not getting enough protein consumption. Um, lactic acid, lactic acid, hydration, electrolytes, um, and making sure like, I like magnesium post-workouts as well. Um, like that DOMS or that delayed onset muscle soreness, um, that could be a good option as well. Uh, from a lymphatic perspective, potentially using, um, like the, uh, uh, the lymph tonic, um, or even other lymphatic herbs like nettles or that kind of thing might be a good option. Are there different strengths in castor oil or is it all the same, like black castor oil versus regular? I've never heard of black castor oil. I don't know if um, it might just be a different name for it. Um, the one that is most widely available and the one that's most widely studied is um, the like the castor bean. So ricinus communis is the is the Latin for it. So I don't know if it's just referred to in, in other forms formats. Um, that is what's going to have the high degree of ricin and then something called ricinoleic acid, which is that really unique fatty acid that loves fat and loves water. So it has, it's absorbed, but it also draws circulation. Um, so that's the one I'm familiar with. And I believe it's to be the most potent, if not the only like castor oil. Yeah. Um, that's it for the questions in Q and I'll just go to the last ones in chat. Sure. I have somebody raising their hand. I don't know if um, she had wanted to ask a question out loud. Uh, Maria, did you raise your Marie or Maria, did you raise your hand? Uh, pop in the chat if you want us to unmute you. I don't know if the hand is still raised. I'm just trying to find my participants here. Uh, Maria, Maria, are you okay if I unmute you? Hi, Maria. Hey. Hi, did you have a question? 
No. Okay, I just saw your hand raised. Okay. Oh, probably it was accidentally. Okay. Okay, no problem. I'll just sorry about that. That's okay. I'll just mute you, okay? Yes. Okay. Um what is the maximum amount of herb used for a glass of tea? Oh, good question. Um depends on the mm. the potency that we're wanting to achieve. Like I um I'm more of a fewer more concentrated formulation, even when I'm formulating tinctures, I would say like my max is typically five herbs. Um, but sometimes we're doing it for the medicinal components. Sometimes we're doing it as like a flavor agent, right? So, um, I, my general rule is five, um, five or less. Um, but it, it totally depends on what you're trying to achieve with, with the tea. But then you look at like spice blends, like Indian spice blends, Chinese spice blends, and they're using like seven to eight herbs, right? <laughs> so it just depends if we're going for flavor or uh, medicinal function, um, that kind of thing as well. So, all right. All right. I think we're, I think we, we covered a lot. <laughs> you still want to take the few questions that are left? Uh, sure. I'll take two more. Okay. Uh, best herbs to fend off cold sores or heal fast? Mm. Um, so our deep immune may be a good support because basically we're looking to strengthen the immune system or bring balance into the immune system to prevent them from occurring in the first place. Um, cold sores are a virus. They're part of the viral family. So uh, deep immune is really good at preventing those uh, viral infections. Um, so during the active infection, you may look to other antiviral herbs. Um, licorice can sometimes be a good one. Um, St. John's wort is a really good antiviral herb. Uh, but again, it just depends on um, if you can take those herbs. Um, and then the last question, well, it's not the last question, but it's the one that was asked, I guess, okay. the earliest. Um, can you take milk thistle after its due date? Uh, like its expiry date? I believe so. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, if it's a tincture, almost like 100%, yes. Um, the, the tinctures are, I think our uh, expiry is three, three years or five years. Um, tinctures often don't go bad, especially milk thistle where it is these different um, uh, flavolignans and the silymarin complex. Um, they don't really tend to denature over time, like once they're extracted, they're stabilized in that alcohol. Um, if it's a capsule, it's hard to say like when it was uh, bottled, what the potency was. Um, they don't typically go bad. Um, it's not like a fish oil where if it goes bad or rancid, you actually cause more harm. You, it just might not be as potent, but I would say, um, yeah, as the tincture, more than likely it's totally fine. If it's a capsule, you'll probably just lose potency. Awesome. Um, there were a few questions about how to access this again. So uh, for those that are looking for the recording, um, Healthy Planet does send out an e-blast with the, the recorded webinar. So I'm just gonna post the link in the chat uh, for those that, don't ha that haven't signed up to their uh, e-blast yet. Um, you can do so in the link. Awesome, okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for all your fantastic questions. Hope you learned something and uh, have a good rest of your evening. <laughs>